This will be a quick introduction to thermodynamics based on the most basic ideas of statistical mechanics. Everything is based on energy and momentum. So let's first review conservation of energy. Remember that we wrote k plus u final equals k plus u initial plus the non-conservative work done on the system. And we like to refer to the total of the kinetic and potential energies as the mechanical energy E. That allows us to write a very compact expression that says E equals E naught plus the non-conservative work, or that the change in E is due to that non-conservative work, usually work done by external forces. It will help here if we make it very clear that this is mechanical energy that's due to those external work. Now, let's use this to look at an old example, a very familiar example, where we bring an object to, the, to rest by doing negative work on it. We've got a box here with mass m moving to the right. It's got a kinetic energy 1 f mv squared and a momentum of mv i hat. It hits the wall and stops. So its kinetic energy goes to zero and its momentum goes to zero. The momentum goes to zero because of the force that's acting to the left that's a negative acceleration that changes the momentum from positive to zero. That same force does negative work, which we can see because the work energy theorem gives us that negative k naught is equal to that external work. Now we often would say that this energy was energy that was lost to heat. That's what comes from an atomic picture of matter. So what changes if we assume that matter consists of atoms is that there's an additional kind of energy that we call internal energy that has to be added to our expression for conservation of energy. Until you accept that atoms are real, you'll just have a body of mass m, what we've done, in fact, all through the semester. That mass m moving to the right at speed v has a kinetic energy of 1 f mv squared and a momentum of mv i hat. Now what happens if we assume it's made up of atoms is nothing really changes. When that object is moving to the right, those atoms are all moving to the right, each one moving at speed v. Each of them has a kinetic energy of 1 half little mv squared and a momentum of little mvi. And when you combine n of them, you get exactly what you had before. That is, the motion of the mass m is a collective motion of n atoms, where the total mass m was equal to n times the little mass m. And of course, normally n is extremely large to the point where we don't even notice that there's atoms there. Now, the reason we have to have internal energy is if we imagine that we've actually got a gas rather than a solid, and that gas is made of atoms, those atoms in the gas are free to move around. So there's kinetic energy due to the random motion of those atoms, even when the gas as a whole is at rest. This is very different. If we have n atoms moving randomly inside of a box, their individual velocities will average out to a total momentum of zero because you'll have objects moving to the right, left, up, down, sideways, whatever, so that the random sum of those velocity vectors times their individual masses will give you a momentum of zero. But the kinetic energy is the scalar, so it adds. And we just get n times m times 1 half mv squared, 1 half capital mv squared. This random kinetic energy is a completely new kind of thing, and we refer to it as internal energy or thermal energy. The average amount of this random energy is what we call temperature. As a result, it's useful to sometimes think of internal energy as hot. That's to distinguish it from heat. Hot, something at a high temperature, something that has a lot of internal energy. The terminology that's used is instead of E internal is to use capital U for internal energy. The idea here is that it's a sort of stored thermal energy. So it's given a symbol that makes it look like it's potential energy. Anyway, if we're going to do this, we have to include that energy in our conservation of energy equation. So we'll now have the change in mechanical energy plus the change in internal energy would be due to work. More commonly, this would be written as just delta E plus delta U, where we've called e internal energy U because it stores thermal energy. Now, although we still need to include heat to complete this picture, we can use this version to see what happened to the kinetic energy that was lost when the box hit the wall. Remember that at first our atoms had no random kinetic energy. They're all in this box sort of at rest relative to the box as the box moves to the right. Their internal energy is zero. Their temperature is zero because they have no random motion. 
they're moving collectively to the right, what we drew this way in our previous picture. If we move at a velocity v relative to the box, we see all those little atoms at rest. No random energy. Now what happens when it hits the wall? Well, that initial kinetic energy and momentum is still there, but when there's a collision, the massless box stops, but the atoms keep moving and start bouncing around. The momentum of some of the atoms changes, and the collisions act to thermalize the kinetic energy, that is, cause the momentum to be in various random directions. This happens because the wall is assumed to be infinitely massive, so there's no recoil involved there. This is all a very crude approximation, I should tell you. A very crude picture of what's going on. We now have a hot gas inside of a box that's at rest. As the atoms have bounced around, their directions have become random, and therefore their individual momentum vectors add to zero. However, their scalar kinetic energies still add up to the original number that we had. That is, momentum has changed, but not kinetic energy. The box has come to rest, but it's still got energy. That energy is now all internal, and that's what we call heat, or, excuse me, hot. In this picture, no work was done on the box. That is, the total mechanical and internal energy is still adds, has not changed. But the kinetic energy and the mechanical energy has changed. It's negative. So we'll have negative k naught plus u equals zero, so that the internal energy change is equal to the initial kinetic energy. That change in the internal energy is what we measure as an increase in temperature. That is, the thing becomes hotter. Now there's also a new way to change the energy of a system. It's called heat. That's the transfer of thermal energy to one body from another, or of course from its environment. Heat's called Q and is put on the input side with work. So either Q, heat, or W, work, can change the mechanical energy or internal energy of a system. Now in the first law of thermodynamics, we just ignore the whole mechanical energy problem and say, set that delta uh, E to zero and look only at the change in internal energy due to heat and work. I should also be clear here that I'm using the physics version of this statement where the change in internal energy is equal to Q plus the work done on the gas. That is, both Q and work are energy inputs. The engineer version of this says the change in internal energy is Q minus the work done by the gas, which is what we use when we want to understand how a machine like a car engine works. Anyway, heat provides a different way to change the energy of the system, one that doesn't require doing any work. Consider a different version of what happens to a gas in a box. Start with all of the atoms at rest. Here it's clearly at temperature zero. These atoms are all sitting quietly at the bottom of the box with zero kinetic energy, no random energy at all. We light a fire under it. Now that fire is an environment of moving atoms. It's also atomic. It's also got a microscopic uh, picture just like we would have of a gas, because it is, after all, a gas, a very hot gas. Atoms in the fire collide with the ones in the box. As those collisions take place, they transfer momentum and energy. This process continues until the average energies are the same. Remember, average energy is what we mean by temperature, so that means they're at the same temperature. Now those atoms inside the box are moving around with a random kinetic energy, much higher than they had before. And in fact, now we've got, according to the little length of the arrows that I'm using here in this very crude model, a system that again has zero total momentum. The box is at rest, but the average kinetic energy of the individual atoms has increased, so it now has a kinetic energy just as we had before when we had a box of gas hit the wall and become hot. Now this last example, if we use the first law with work equals zero, this is a statement that the change in internal energy is equal to heat, Q. Right? What we've done is we've put energy in, called heat, and increased the internal energy, making the thing hot. Now this expression is why we can obtain a model for U, make a model of a material like an ideal gas, and get an expression for its internal energy and use the delta U to predict the specific heat of a particular thing, such as the specific heat of an ideal gas. We can also go the other way. We can use data on the specific heat and latent heat of a real material to learn something about the internal structure of the material, because after all, what's happening is 
what, uh, in fact, what the heat is telling us is how we change the internal energy, how many different ways, for example, we can change the average kinetic energy of molecules or atoms uh, as we increase the temperature. So that a certain amount of energy has to be put in to increase the temperature. That increase of energy is the specific heat that is shown as the slope of the internal energy versus the temperature for either a particular mass of a material or for a particular number of moles of material. When you have a change in state so that the energy goes into potential energy, then that line goes straight up vertical because we have a change in internal energy without a change in temperature. That's something that happens whenever a material changes state and you have what's called a first order phase transition. Okay, now each of these ideas can require, require an entire chapter, not to mention several days in class, to work out the details or apply them to real materials. In fact, you can take an entire course to learn how to apply uh, some of the models for real materials uh, within this picture called statistical mechanics. But remember that the big picture is all about energy and momentum and forces. So anyway, to uh, copyright type things, I've taken and modified extensively pictures taken from our textbook.